ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله فقال الله تعالى يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون وقال الله تعالى يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الحديث هدي رسول الله وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم ما بعد i do not know how many of you have realized that today is the last day of the hijri calendar 1443 It is the 30th of Dhul-Hijjah. So tomorrow actually is a new year, at least for the Hijri calendar, for the lunar calendar that Muslims follow. Tomorrow, inshallah, will be the first day of Muharram, of the year 1444. When I think about this, oftentimes the idea of resolutions comes to mind. What resolutions will people be making for this? Obviously, people have a long list of resolutions that they prepare and start thinking of from the 29th the 30th and for sure by the 31st of December but i ask you how many of us make resolutions when it comes to the hijri calendar not because the hijri calendar is superior or inferior but the idea of what exactly does the hijri calendar stand for us it is after all dictating our religiosity ramadan hajj the the four sacred months of the year all of them are connected directly with the hijri calendar and when it comes to resolutions many people what they do with their resolutions are almost squarely focusing on their body never on the heart never with the soul always with the actions i want to lose weight i want to start dyeing my hair i want to get married i want to get a better job and these are multiple of the resolutions that people make and break every single year i ask brothers and sisters if you calculate the number of minutes in a day how many of those minutes do we utilize truly Think about this. Actually, this question was posed to me right now on the way here by my son. He said, "Father, how many minutes minutes are there are there in a day?" And before I can answer, he said, "So it's 60 times 24." I said, "You're right. Number of minutes is 1440. Almost 1500 minutes in a day. Aside from daily requirements like eating, sleeping, drinking, using the bathroom, and so on and so forth, how many of those minutes do you utilize?" There are almost 1500 minutes 1440 minutes in a day do we utilize them and when i say utilize them how do we benefit from them often times times for my own benefit i try to recount the life of a person who truly utilized his time whose new year's resolutions if he made any must have been truly fantastic and very likely inimitable difficult for us to copy very likely unlikely for us to copy this man His name is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn Mughira ibn Bardisba al-Ju'fi but he's well known in the ummah as Al-Imam al-Bukhari Allah yarhamhu and his life is a fascinating fascinating story to study <coughs> truly it's his life is very very interesting of how much trials and tribulations he experienced how much monumental joy that he received and pleasures that he got in the life of this world itself when it comes to his impact on the ummah and it's amazing that there's not a single khutbah there's not a single lecture not a single talk of any degree of authenticity uttered by the ummah for 12 centuries except sahih al bukhari is mentioned or referred to or benefited from the most famous ahadith the most authentic ahadith the most beneficial ahadith the most beneficial aspects or stayings of the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam collected in one book have been authored by this one man the amount of acceptability qubuliyah that allah has granted his work and him is mind boggling 
Think about this. You are sitting in a lecture, maybe even this khutbah, and you hear a new hadith, or a hadith that you're not familiar with. Maybe others have heard it, but you've not heard it. And something in the hadith brings a slight doubt in your heart. Is that truly from our religion? But at the end of the hadith, the speaker quotes, Rawahu al-Bukhari, or narrated by Bukhari. The moment you hear this, Alhamdulillah. If it's in Sahih Bukhari, it must be Sahih. I ask you, is this kind of acceptability and sense of reassurance found in any work? There's truly something that this man did in his life that Allah SWT put so much khair and so much acceptance in his work. Not just this book, he's authored many books. But this book in particular stands out. He was born on the 13th of Shawwal in the year 194 Hijri, which is very strange. The Muslim Ummah cannot decide and are not sure the day of the birth of Prophet or any of the major Sahaba. Or for that matter, a whole host of famous personalities, scholars, generals, rulers throughout history. But when it comes to Imam al-Bukhari, we know for a fact when he was born and when he passed away. The reason for, the, for that is simply that people before they are born or around the time they are born, they're not usually famous unless they're born as a prince or a princess. Most of people are born as commoners. They become famous through their actions later on. However, Imam Bukhari, the reason he was so, his date of birth is so well known was because his father himself, as well as his elder brother, they were engaged in seeking knowledge. He was born in a family that used to seek knowledge. His grandfather, al mughira converted to Islam after his father, Bardizba, was taken as a slave by the armies of Muslims in the time of the conquest of Persia. So Imam Bukhari ethnically is Persian, but he was born, born, in, the time, he was born in the town of Bukhara. That's why he takes the nisbah or the, 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 the signature of being al-Bukhari. Bukhara in modern times uh, is a small tiny town in the current country of Uzbekistan. So if someone was to issue a passport Imam Busar Bukhari, he'll be a native of Uzbekistan. As I said before, at the time of his birth, he was born to a family in which narration of hadith was something very, very, very strongly devoted to. There was something, something very proud of, something they used to seek out. But when he was either at the time of his birth or very early on in his life, it is reported that he became blind. And he lost his sense to, to the ability to see clearly. But here's a very interesting aspect, and this is perhaps the first lesson in our life. His mother, Allah Rahmha, she begged Allah SWT, <coughs> cried and, and groveled and kept making dua, Oh Allah, restore the sight of my son. Mm -hmm. Imam Bukhari said that one day I woke up and my sight was restored. And I ran to my mother and I hugged her, kissed her. And we were crying. I asked you, little sisters, how many of us make a sincere effort to continue making dua for something good? Forget about other people, for ourselves. How quickly do we give up in making dua? Seeking the khair from Allah SWT. Perhaps the reason Allah SWT is not accepting our dua is because there is some benefit for that, for that dua not being accepted. And Allah SWT is the, affair, is, is, the, is the dispenser of all of our affairs. But Allah knows best. Perhaps if, her mother, if his mother had given up, Imam Bukhari must have been one of those billions of Muslims who lived and died, we never heard of them. And perhaps it is her dua that was the primary factor for his vision to be restored. And we all are grateful to the mother of Imam Al Bukhari for her efforts. Because, because of his vision, he learned and traveled so much. He memorized Quran at a very early age, perhaps by the age of 10. But he was truly engaged in the study of hadith. That was in vogue at that time. In our times today, by the way, one thing that people like to study, for example, is medicine, or business, or engineering, computer science. Technology, these are subjects that are in vogue today. These are subjects that we value today, but in their time, in that location, they used to value the study of hadith more than anything else. And this is something that he got into himself. However, what is truly amazing is parents realized early on that Allah SWT had best blessed him with a fantastic memory. A truly amazing memory that is very difficult for us to understand and comprehend. It is said Imam Ibn Kathir, the, the author of Tafsir Ibn Kathir, said that he used to look at one page like this and he would memorize it. Scholars are given interpretation how to understand this. What my teacher said, if every single person in this jama'ah were to say their name and their phone number only once, Al Imam Bukhari memorized everything in sequence. That's how strong of a memory he had. And people like this have existed throughout the centuries, even in our times today. You can find people like these who have excellent memories on YouTube and they'll demonstrate how strong their memory is by reciting something or listening to something once, once and repeating it verbatim. Al-Imam Bukhari was excellent in this matter. 
But the lesson here for you and I is truly this. His parents realized that Allah SWT had given their child a fantastic talent and they cultivated it. It is from the strength of a Muslim that he or she realizes early on in their life what Allah SWT has blessed them with and they work to enhance that talent, not just for their benefit, for the benefit of other people. Like this man did. When he was still in his teens, he traveled to Basra. Basra is west of Khurasan, or uh, where he is in Bukhara specifically. He was from Khurasan. Khurasan is a larger tract where Bukhara was a small tract town. So he traveled west from there towards Hijaz. What's interesting is that historically speaking, Hijaz, Makkah, Medina, Taif, that region has always been uh, associated with two things religiosity and knowledge. And scholars around the world have traveled to these places to make Hajj and Umrah and to seek from the scholars, knowledge from the scholars over there and from each other. So it's very likely that you may hear about a scholar or an alim who lives in Makkah and Medina. Unlikely for you and I to hear about people who live further out. And that has been the case throughout the centuries. No different at that time. People who used to live in Basra and Khurasan were not that well known as opposed to those who were living in Hijaz. Yet when the people of Basra heard that Muhammad ibn Ismail is coming to their town, they left their town, they came outside, waiting outside the town, just so they can receive him. And when he came to them, they grabbed him, begging him, Haddathni, Shaykh, Haddathni, give me hadith, teach me hadith. And he said, not now, not later, later. They grabbed him, made him sit down. And they started learning from him, started giving him hadith outside the town of Basra. It is narrated at that time he did not have any facial hair. Not because he was shaven, but because he was in early teens. Do you understand how impactful this man was? While he was in his early teens, people west of him uncharacteristically had heard about his genius and his, and his scholarship. When he turned 16, he decided it's time for, to make, for me to make Hajj. At the age of 16, brothers and sisters, honestly speaking, how many of us are coaching 16? We have still not made the effort to go for Hajj. Unlike the debacle of this year, many of us had actually made the intention to go for Hajj, including yours truly, and we could not go. But before that, let's be honest, how many of us have had the opportunity to do so? And we've not made the effort for that. Unlike this man, or unlike this young man, he was 16, and he decided Hajj is further upon me. So he sought his mother's permission, and then he took his mother and his brother together, and they went for Hajj, and they went to Hijaz. When he arrived over there, he was mesmerized by the scholarship over there. And as his mother and brother returned back, he begged his mother, please let me stay and continue learning from the scholars here in Hijaz. And he stayed over there for two years. At the age of 18, he authored his first book, Qadaya as sahaba wa tabi'in a highly complex topic, talking about the fatawa of the tabi'in and the, and, the, and the sahaba in one book. I'd like to think of what I was doing when I was 18. I can assure you I was not worried about authoring books, especially not books on such a <coughs> complex topic. <coughs> The same year, at the same age of 18, he published his monumental work, at tarikh al-Kabir. Eight volumes about the biographies of narrators from the time of the Prophet Ali Sosam till his time. It's a large book of history, talking about where each person is located, who, what his proper name, what's his lineage, what, how good was his narrating hadith, so and so forth. It's an encyclopedia of knowledge. And he authored that by the time he was 18. He had mastered these subjects. How many of us are utilizing our time the way this man did? Whenever I read or listen to the Surah the Quran, Wal Asr, Inna Linsana Lafi Khus, Illa Ladina Amanu, Wa Aminu Salihat, Watawa Sawbil Haq, Watawa Sawbil Sawbil. Oftentimes I think of Imam Bukhari because he was so good at utilizing his time. Think about all the teachers, every single person who ever taught you anything. If you can compile a list from that moment you were born till today, how many teachers do you think you must have had? I thought about this long and hard. I don't think the number is yet 200. Of all the things, of all the subjects, of everything that I've ever learned from people, I don't think the number is 200. Al Imam Bukhari had over 1,080 teachers. 1,080. That is a man going from one lecture to another, from the moment that he can start walking till the moment he passed away. Allah When he was in early 20s, he decided he wants to travel further for the sake of knowledge. So he went to Baghdad to learn from the greatest scholars at that time, like Imam Ahmad, like Imam Ibn, Abi, uh, uh, sorry, um, Imam Ibn Is Ishaq ibn Rahawai, like Ibn al-Madini, Ali ibn al-Madini, and many other famous names. 
And in each of these scholars, who are his teachers, they are famous authors themselves. All of their books have survived. And Imam Bukhari was head and shoulders above them. You have to understand the reason why he's so famous, the reason he's so well known, the reason his book is so fantastic is because he was better than all the greatest scholars of his time. And they were indeed the best scholars of Hadith at that time. Yet Imam Bukhari was better than them because of the things that he did in his life, because of the efforts he made for the sake of preserving the Sunnah of the Prophet In the second part of the book, we talk about how much he valued the, and how much he respected the Sunnah and how, one, how much he wanted to preserve it. Akuli Khawli Hadad Prophet, Nani Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Before we continue, may I request those who are in the back, please move forward, and those who are in the front, compress and come closer to each other. There is very little space in this much, and one brother and sister sitting outside to be able to come inside, inshallah. There is nothing we can benefit from the life of Imam Bukhari, at least we can learn from his manners. Because Allah had truly blessed him with a fantastic set of manners and morals. He had a beautiful akhlaq. It's mentioned that he said, I have never backbitten anybody since I learned that backbiting was haram. I told everybody. He memorized the entire Quran before the age of 10. So he has not backbitten anybody since he was a youngster. It is said that he was so good at maintaining people's expectations, he was by, by trade, he was a cloth merchant. He used to buy and sell textile for cloth. So one day, he was traveling by ship, having made a fantastic profit. And he related to one of his shipmates that I have with me, profits worth 10,000 dinar. This man, who was a listener, he had some evil in his heart. What he did, he went outside in the ship and he asked the people, my 10,000 dinar have been stolen which was a custom at that time, the, the captain of the ship had the entire ship searched. They could not find anything. There's no money. So this man comes to Imam Bukhari, look at his audacity. This man comes to Imam Bukhari and says, where is the 10,000 dinar? I know you do not lie. What happened to the money? And Imam Bukhari said, when you did your dirty trick, I took the money and threw it in the river. The man said, 10,000 dinar. You threw 10,000 dinar in the river, why? He said, I spent a lifetime cultivating the image that I protect and defend the Sunnah. I cannot allow you to sully that image. Brothers and sisters, I ask you, how many of us have allowed our integrity to be brought into question for a few dollars? When we say something, when it comes to buying and selling, many times we, we swerve left and right. Sometimes we go backwards completely on this. Alimah Bukhari threw away 10,000 dinar so that no one ever throughout history can say Alimah Bukhari stole something, ever even suspect something like that. And did Allah SWT give rewarding for something like that? Yes. 12 centuries down the line, I'm talking about it to you. He bought khair and inshallah acceptance from Allah SWT and the, and the worship of Allah because of this 10,000 dinar. How much he protects his image. How much he wants to say only good things. How much does he not want to jump on social media and malign other people. Brothers and sisters, take lessons from this man's life. In another instance, maintaining people's expectations. He had a stall in which he was selling cloth. And a person came and looked at the merchandise that Imam Bukhari had on sale. The man said, what about this and this? And Imam Bukhari quoted him a price. The man said, okay, let me think about this. I'll come back and tomorrow and talk to you about this. When the man left, somebody else comes, looks at the same merchandise and offers double. And Imam Bukhari said, no. Why? Because I had given my word to the first guy that this cloth will be here when he comes tomorrow. If he comes tomorrow. Allah SWT says in the Quran, Quran Ya ayyuladina amanu, ufu bil O people you believe, fulfill your transactions, fulfill your expectations, fulfill the promise that you make to people. And Imam Bukhari is a perfect example of this thing. He is fulfilling people's expectations for something that he is not required to fulfill. Just because the other guy said, perhaps I'll come tomorrow, and perhaps I'll agree to your price. And Imam Bukhari kept that that piece of cloth there for him to buy. <coughs> Aside from the fact that he was himself a fantastic student, it is a testimony of his studious no, uh, nature that he created, uh, he left behind a fantastic cadre of students. 
Amongst his students are great imams who themselves were luminaries and visionaries. Among them are Imam Muslim, who also authored the book called Sahih, Sahih Muslim. Amongst his teachers, amongst his students is Imam at Tirmidhi, who authored a book called Jam at Tirmidhi. Amongst his students, Imam al-Nasai, who authored a book called Sunan al-Nasai. And many, 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 many great scholars of hadith were his direct students. Imam Bukhari, listen to this. Imam Bukhari had only 1,080 teachers, but he taught his Sahih al-Bukhari, and I'm not exaggerating, to 90,000 students. 90,000 students in his lifetime. He traveled left and right. There was no center of learning on this earth where Islam was taught except Al Imam Bukhari was there. No major center. He learned from the best and he created the best cadre of students because he traveled so much. And because of this reason, so many learned direct, people learned directly from him. And that's the reason why his book became well known far and wide. There's one lesson for here, and this will be the end of all our lessons today, inshallah. If we want to have an impact of the Ummah, we have to exert ourselves. And the exertion does not stop any time. Even when he became a teacher, he did not decide to just sit down on location and teach from there. He still was traveling to the same extent, and he was sharp as a tact until when he reached the age of 62. At that age, he decided, I would like to retire. And the people of Bukhara that begged him, Ya Imam, come back. We are your family. We are your hometown. We are the people whom you grew up in. Come back to our town. Stay over there and retire over there. Like any great scholar, that's what he wanted. So he went back to Bukhara, and he being a teacher, he started teaching the Masjid of Bukhara over there. The governor of Bukhara, he made a demand. And this is the case of many governors and people in rulership. They're hardly people who have intelligence. And they're almost always self-serving, as was this man. So the governor of Bukhara demanded of Imam Bukhari, come to my palace and teach my two sons hadith. And Imam Bukhari, like any noble scholar, said, I don't sell uh, the sunnah of the Prophet Ali Sussan. The Masjid is open. They are more than welcome to come and learn the lesson of people. This really incensed governor. He became really mad at Imam Bukhari. He made life very difficult for him over there. To the extent that the noble Imam had to leave his own hometown and go outside and wait to permit, seek permission to get back inside his town. And at that moment, on the first day of Shawwal, on the day of Eid al-Fitr, Allah SWT decreed that Allah SWT decreed that his life will be taken. Imam Bukhari Allah passed away on the day of Eid al-Fitr, year 256 Hijri, waiting to enter his own town in Al-Bukhara. And we ask Allah SWT to grant mercy and rahmah to this man, accept his, his, his book and his efforts, and make the ummah follow his example as well as example of whose example he was following. <laughs> إنك أنت الوهاب اللهم اغفر المسلمين لهم المسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياه منهم والأموات إنك السميع مجيب الدعوات سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وقيم الصلاة